Hello everybody and welcome back for more Warhammer Fantasy Lore with me, the Border Prince. Today we're covering Regiments of Renown again with three more of the classics. The first of which is Al Mukhtar's Desert Dogs. Perhaps the most problematic and clear example of cultural appropriation endemic in the old world are Al Mukhtar's Desert Dogs. These chaps hail from the coasts of Araby in the south and were originally a band of bandits, which which is a pretty common thing in that part of the world. They would have remained a simple raiding band, eking out an existence, stealing camels and the odd bit of coin, had they not encountered Werner Glock. Werner is the son of a noble family in the merchant city of Marienburg. Like many of his kind, he was packed off to an exclusive boys' school by his parents at an early age, which sucked balls, as not only was he desperately lonely, but he was also bullied, beaten and treated like a slave by his classmates. His only escape from this horrid existence was in books, telling tales of foreign lands and adventure. I'm sure we can all relate. Reaching adulthood, Werner left the city of merchants and international finance, Marienburg, and began to explore the world, eventually arriving in Lashkek, the largest city of Araby. Unbeknownst to Werner at the time, a superstitious rumour was doing the rounds in the city that it was prophesied Al Mukhtar, which means the Chosen One, was about to reveal himself that year. What this Chosen One was intended to do wasn't exactly clear, but when the blonde and blue-eyed foreigner showed up, able to speak the local tongue fluently, many in the city began to whisper that he was Al Mukhtar. Werner didn't know anything about all this at all, and continued on with his mission of being a proto-tourist by arranging to head out into the desert to visit some of the interesting pyramid-shaped ruins. As he moved out on the desert roads with a party of hired packmen and guides, they were attacked by the soon-to-be desert dogs. His guides and other servants fled, all except the blind beggar boy Ibn, who didn't realise what was happening, and was taken captive along with Werner. Now, Werner refused to flee, which is probably due to the obstinance beat into him at school. The bandits eventually subdued him after a surprisingly hard fistfight in which he showed all the hard-won lessons from his schooling and beat the crap out of a few of them. The desert dog leader, Sheikh Almed Shufti, decided to roast one of the captured camels and to stake Werner out to be beaten and burned by the sun for a few days until he slowly died. Shufti reckoned this was a just punishment for the foreigner and that it would be a good old laugh to hear his cries of pain. Sounds like a nice bloke. After three days, Werner hadn't said a word, despite the pain. Having become resistant to this kind of imaginative and unnecessarily cruel torture as his uh, school's punch bag. This unnerved the bandits, and more so when Ibn told them of the word in the city that he may be al Mukta, which they began to repeat to each other in fright. Ibn also explained that the loss of many of their personal belongings since he had been captured was a sign that al Mukta had cursed them, and definitely no other reason. Werner decided to shout al Mukta, not knowing what it meant, but seeing the terror it evoked in the bandits, and upon hearing the cries of the foreigner, they fell to their knees to beg forgiveness. Werner, now taking the name al Mukta, joined the bandits and led them to great success up and down the Araby coast, eventually necessitating the Sheikh of Lashak to bribe them off and send them to the land of the dead, and hopefully oblivion. This was not to be, however, and despite success against the undead, and Werner seeing all the sights down there, the desert dogs became eager to move on, so he had to lead them north through the badlands and into the border princes, where the raiders found themselves adept at the swift-moving combat of these pioneer lands, and have been in work, or at least earning coin one way or another, ever since. The curse of Al Mukta still seems to be in effect, so the desert dogs constantly show conspicuous valour in combat, to prove their loyalty to their captain and hopefully lift the curse which sees their valuables stolen from their pockets and saddlebags continuously. At least this is what Ibn, now the regiment's standard bearer, tells them to do. The Birdmen of Katraza. One of the most unique regiments to offer their services to the rich and ambitious is the Flying Crossbowmen of Katraza Regiment. With their bird masks, crossbows and winged contraptions of wood and cloth, 
The Birdmen are probably the oddest sight on the battlefield, able to swoop down across the enemy, unleashing crossbow bolts from above. The Birdmen have become feared and respected since their formation. Their leader, Dadalo, Dadalo was an already an accomplished craftsman and builder when he came across some lost manuscripts from the legendary Leonardo da Marigliano, which appeared to show several machines which would allow men to fly. Dadalo, I'm going with Dadalo, became obsessed with these designs. Unfortunately, they were later found to be fake. But Dadalo had gone full reign, and the man couldn't be stopped, much to the amusement of the people of his city of Varezzo, which would gather to watch him jump from its many towers with different prototypes of flying machine. Thankfully for Dadalo, he did have one of Marigliano's real inventions, the parachute, so the failures didn't become terminal. Anyways, the fun stopped one day. Dadalo crashed through the roof of the Bata family, a powerful group within the city. Falling through the roof, he landed in the bath of Lady Batter, who was using it at the time. This is bad enough, obviously, but he also landed on and killed the captain of her bodyguard, who for some reason was also using the bath. For, he, <laughs> for this crime, and the shame and embarrassment it caused in high society, Dadalo was imprisoned in the Leaning Tower of Rezzo. Dadalo was not going to stay and rot there, and thankfully his jailers hadn't bothered to block his window. Probably having heard of his attempted flights, they didn't think escape from this great height was an option. More fool them. Dadalo managed to construct a birdman harness from bedsheets and the wooden furniture. And it actually worked, and he flew off and escaped. Having left his property behind and with no prospects, he did what many Attilian has done, and decided to become a mercenary by forming a regiment of flying crossbowmen. Who the hell agreed to this, I don't know. Searching out the thinnest and lightest marksmen he could find, and training them to fly using his invention, they swiftly gained employment at the Battle of Motta Zorella, where they turned a rout into victory for their employer by swooping down and abducting the enemy general by escaping into the sky. They gained their name during yet another one of their conflicts between Marigliano and the city of Ramus, where they were hired to rescue the beautiful Isabella Delecta from the Leaning Tower of Catraza, which was such a dangerous task that upon completing this mission, they began to refer to themselves as the Birdmen of Catraza, and are now known by this name from the shores of Estilia to the plains of Kislev. Gogfag's Ogres Gogfag Maneater is a legend the world over, even if he has changed a bit over the years. Anyway, with a sense of adventure and a band of fellow hungry ogres alongside, he left the eastern plains and headed towards the world's edge mountains. It was here he first developed the taste for man flesh. And although this is defo up there on his top 10 things to eat, it was later that Gogfag decided that halflings were in fact his favourite food. Gogfag joined Nashrak Badtooth in his siege of Carrot Kadrin and sampled dwarf flesh for the first time. Nice for sure, and better than orc, but nowhere near as good as a nice spitted halfling. Anyways, Gogfag joined the orcs and the siege, but after a while, Nashrak lost all patience with the belligerent ogres and their continued drinking, shouting, and the eating of a large chunk of the hordes of goblins. One night, the ogres were partying, and the warlord finally snapped. And he and Gogfag had a massive fistfight, which resulted in Gogfag ripping the warlord's arm off, and then using it to beat a path out of the orcs' camp with his lads. He decided to head to Carrot Kadrin, as another path would have seen them cut to pieces by the surrounding Greenskin Horde, and asked to join Ungrim Iron Fist in fighting the orcs. And, well, he had the warlord's arm right there, so this was probably not a trap. The ogres led the dwarves on a secret route and they attacked the Greenskins camp and captured Nashrak alive, putting him in chains. While the dwarves celebrated their feat, Gogfag broke into the treasury and stole as much as he and his lads could carry before making their way into the empire before the dwarves could pursue. They would take up paid employment with the Imperial Army and much to their pleasure and the horror of the moot, Gogfag had his first halfling, which he thought was divine. Unfortunately, the Empire became tired of the ogres' behaviour and their drinking and consumption of many of the citizens of their country. 
by the supposed protectors. Gogfag led his man-eaters into Tilia, and they quite literally were man-eaters at this point, but it wasn't malicious, you understand, they were just hungry and liked the taste. In Tilia, they gained employment with Prince Lorenzo Lupo, and although obviously fearsome troops, the trouble they caused the city of Lucini was considerable, and the drunken mob of ogres would have regularly beat random citizens, robbed them, and generally get bullied about by them. Things reached ahead when Gogfag led his boys into Lupo's personal warehouses and liberated gallons of wine. The comatose ogres were rounded up and placed in the dungeons by the irate Lupo. Luckily for Gogfag, a few days later, a recruiter from the Border Princes showed up after Mercs, and Lupo happily took the finder's fee and released the ogres to the man who led them off to fight in the Border Princes. Gogfag wasn't best pleased by this, but with the offer of freedom, work, a baggage train of food to leave the city, or a firing squad, the choice was clear. The ogres did well, and grew fat and rich in their chaotic frontier territories for a few years, until they fell in with another orc horde, attacking the dwarfs of Karak Kadrin again. This horde was tricked by Ungrim Iron Fist, into attacking a convoy of supply wagons full of cheap ale. The army now utterly pissed was rounded up for some reason, probably just spite, and placed in the dungeon deep in Carrot Kadrin, Gogfag and his lads amongst them. After a few months, the dwarfs opened the dungeon and found just two ogres alive and a mound of bones in one corner. Gogfag had only eaten one of Scaff's legs out of respect for his friend. Ungrim decided to let them go after this display, and since then, Gogfag has been romping around the world, making and losing fortunes. He has raided Ulfwan, looked upon Skavenblight, and been awarded honours by Karl Franz himself. Gogfag is a legend, and the most famous ogre to walk the world, and a massive benefit to any army he fights with, even if his appetite may cause problems when not bashing and cutting down the enemy. And with that, I will leave you. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this exploration of some of the more famous mercenaries in the old world. Please remember to like, subscribe, and share if you enjoyed this stuff, and let me know below if there's any other fantasy subjects you'd like me to cover. I'd like to thank my YouTube sponsors, Vecna71 and American Alpharius, as well as my patrons on Patreon, Corey Dessur, Fernin, and Brett Boyanowski. Again, lads, I'm sorry. I just can't, I can't get me in mouth around those names. <laughs> See you next time. Thanks for watching. Cheers.